Pandora. Everyone says immediately, Pandora's box. And indeed, the story is associated with Pandora's box in that the um, prisoners who were captured by the Pandora were from the bounty. Um, they were put into a special um, cell that was built on the Pandora's quarter deck. And one of them um, was a really reasonably well-educated um, man. He started referring to it as Pandora's box. The origin of Pandora's box is that Pandora was a Greek goddess or a demi-goddess, I'm not exactly sure, but she was incredibly beautiful and she was married to Zeus, I think, and uh, Zeus gave her a box and told her, whatever you do, do not open the box, um, but didn't tell her why she shouldn't open the box. And Pandora, uh, and I know this is rather a male chauvinist p thing to say, um, <coughs> being a woman, uh, couldn't help herself and peeked into the, uh, the, lifted the lid of the box and lo and behold all the evils um, and uh, good things escaped into the world and this is how we have evil and, and, and blessings as well. And the only thing that remained inside the box was hope. And I guess the, um, uh, for the mutineers who had been captured by HMS Pandora, the mutineers from the bounty, I guess they knew that they were on their way home to England and to be tried uh, for their role in the mutiny and uh, their inevitable fate if they had been found uh, guilty would have been to have their neck stretched and uh, they would have been hung. That's actually the amazing background to the, the Pandora story. In the 90s uh, the Queensland Museum having done some preliminary work in the 80s were enabled by a grant that they got from the government to go and uh, do some more field work on, on the site and to really um, do justice to the diving that was required. It was a deep site, 100, 110 feet. And it, it was quite clear after the 80s that we needed um, a lot of money. And uh, that money came in the form of um, a fundraising campaign that was run by the Pandora Foundation. It was a group of um, um, Townsville and Thuringawa business people who got together and uh, said basically, how much do you need? <laughs> well, I said $3 million would be fine. This was in the early 90s. And it enabled us to mount five major expeditions. And uh, Pandora became a museum piece. There's a, a very large one-on-one -on -one reconstruction inside the Great Gallery, as it's called. And off to one side, there is the Pandora Gallery, in which the whole story is told given that in those days, at that particular time when the Navy was furnishing ships, um, they basically had women figureheads, especially if they were mythical personalities, uh, and they were always bare-breasted, um, and this is Queensland censorship. Uh, um. <laughs> Anyhow, in terms of an archaeologist being in a museum and getting to work on what is actually the important thing, the new evidence that was recovered from the, from the shipwreck, is to actually have the, the real everyday material that is in use at the time of the voyage. We know a lot about the Pandora's voyage because one of the crew actually published his memoirs and uh, so we know a lot about all these details. In terms of being able to have the space to really spread out and, and set out the, the material culture of what we have found on of what we have recovered on board is, is it wasn't tremendously fantastic to have that space after we had only been in the old museum in Brisbane. It was a cast of uh, hundreds. We had all sorts of people um, coming in, volunteering their expertise, conservators from WA, conservators from the National Maritime Museum. There were a lot of new people that were trained up, uh, archaeology graduates from university. It was a major, a major logistical undertaking to, to get 40 odd people onto the site living on the vessel. We had to take everything with us. Of course we had a recompression chamber that was required for workplace health, health and safety purposes. Uh, we had a dive co coordination hut because we had actually had two teams diving off this very large vessel. That, um, and of course it was extremely expensive and uh, even though three million dollars was a lot of money we chewed through it very quickly 
um, given that um, a vessel of the type that we use as the mother vessel cost about seven thousand dollars a day just to just to be there and that was that was actually um, at mates rate so I'll just briefly give you a bit of an overview of what the wreck actually looks like at the moment uh, and this is a, a, a a grab from a, a BBC film called Pandora's Secrets. We've tried to reconstruct what actually happened um, to the ship once it had bounced over the reef and had sunk in, in, the, shell, in the lee of this reef uh, in about um, 110 feet of water. So here you have the ship bouncing across the reef, um, damaging its bottom of course, and then gradually they were trying to sort of stop her from sinking, but after about six or seven hours, the pumps broke down uh, and she went down to the bottom um, and probably sank like that, um, falling over onto her starboard side. She sort of gradually settled into the, into the sea floor and basically two things happened. Um, there was seabed buildup from the bottom up and deterioration of the structure, its wooden structure, uh, from the top down. And so where those two processes essentially <coughs> met each other, that's where there's this, like a cutoff, and everything under that has been well preserved. So given that it's over on its starboard side, there's more of the starboard side preserved and less of the port side of the vessel. It's been amazing to recover the material from, from the wreck because one of the things that became quite obvious that there was a lot of Polynesian material that had been collected by the crew. It, it turns out that the Pandora's trip, and there was a lot of recruiting going on, uh, and that was done in His Majesty's Navy, that was done at the time by press gangs. So some of them were just there, sort of, you know, because they'd been, they'd been put there, but others, um, others, um, specifically wanted to go because they heard that Pandora was going to go into the South Pacific and they wanted to go there because they knew that they could collect what was called artificial curiosities, that's what they were referred to in the, uh, in the late 18th century. And they knew that they uh, would collect these, they would exchange them for um, nails and bits of glass and beads and but also tools, iron tools. The Tahitians were very keen to have that type of European technology. There's a still a, a lot more to do uh, on, the, on the wreck. There's a lot of diving. We've done five major seasons in the 90s and uh, that research is still ongoing. Um, the collection is up in, um, in, in Townsville. There's a, a very large um, display, about uh, 600 square meters worth of display in which the whole story uh, and the background to the story and all the material that we've recovered um, is, is, is there and um, yeah, it'll probably be kept there until somebody else turns up and says we want to continue on with the Pandora. As far as the Queensland Museum is concerned, um, we, there's a, a representative collection of material from the wreck and there's no real um, reason to, um, to keep going because collecting the material means that there's a, a, a tremendous responsibility on being able to keep it and be able to a to stabilize it because it's been underwater uh, and then b to keep it and it's a, it's a very expensive um, exercise. <laughs>